Dear students, let us start the discussion on today's newspaper that is 30th April 2016. The first article is related to the reservations in Gujarat. In a response to the Patidar Andolan, the Gujarat government has announced the reservations to the upper caste who are economically backward. Here the economically backward is defined as any household income less than 6 lakhs of rupees. So in this context let us analyze to what extent it holds the constitutionality. Now Gujarat already has 49% of the reservations. With this 10% of the reservations it crosses to 59% which is above the limit set by the Supreme Court in Mandal case. In Indira Sahani versus Union of India case the Supreme Court's one of the criteria is the reservation shall not cross the 50% mark. Already the reservations on the basis of the economic criteria were tried before. And 81st Amendment Act, it tried to bring in the reservations to the economically backward classes. And Supreme Court has clearly said it as against to the constitution because the constitution allows for only the socially and educationally backward classes as the criteria for reservations. The extent to which it will stand to the Supreme Court scrutiny or judicial scrutiny is very less. But however it is more seen as a political stunt to face the elections in the coming year because through the judicial process to go it takes some time. In this case most of the doubts the students ask is this why in Tamil Nadu 69% of the reservations are allowed. Now the matter is kept in the ninth schedule of the constitution where judicial review is withheld but however it is also now under the judicial review but the matter is subjudice. The Supreme Court has submitted to the constitutional bench for review. Now coming to the anti-defection law and the Manish Tiwari's article remember that Whatever anti-defection law, the fundamental argument is this. Is it curtailing the freedom of the parliamentarian MPR MLA to express his views in the house? Now the 52nd Amendment Act, it has brought the anti-defection law, which has given the primacy to the party over the candidate, over the member of parliament. A party can issue whip on any matter under the anti-defection law. In this case, the parties are issuing the whips even for the trivial matters. There are two challenges to the anti-defection law. It is criticized that the anti-defection law is allowing for a major defection. Because as of now, if two-thirds of the members they cross the floors, then they do not come under the anti-defection law and disqualification. If you take Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, in Telangana from Telugu Desam Party, more than two-thirds of the people over a period of time defected to the TRS. But however, the speaker considered all these defections as one single defection and uh, did not apply for the anti-defection law. On the other hand, if you go to the uh, Uttarakhand, where the defection of few members, uh, the speaker was ready to admit that uh, and he has uh, disqualified them. It means the speaker's discretion is another challenge over here. And the third challenge is related to the freedom of the voice to be expressed by the members. As for the Westminster parliamentarian system, so the member has, shall have every freedom to express his voice against a particular law. And in India, most of the laws, they do not come with sunset clauses. Sunset clause here means there is a prefixed dead line or dead date when the law becomes some. Uh, extinct or now becomes invalid. So in this context, um, a law once enacted, it will have the life for more than 100 years in India. So in this case, um, the law has to be thoroughly debated and the reactions of the members need to be noted. In this case, if we have to empower the legislatures, uh, what we need to do? The scope of the anti-defection law and the right of the parties to issue the whip has to be reduced to few of the incidences. For example, it has to be reduced only to the
confidence, no confidence motion, voting on the money bill, etc. With regard to many other ordinary bills, the parliamentarian shall be allowed to freely discuss the issues. So these are the issues discussed over here. Recently, Dokun Yusa, an old Uyghur Congress leader, he was denied visa by India after giving a visa, sanctioning a e visa. So the reason given by India is there is a red corner notice pending against him. Now, if you in reality observe, the red corner notice is a message that he was wanted in some other country, and the second is. Many other countries, mostly China, Vietnam, Cambodia, all these countries have issued red corner notices against the political dissidents. So in this case, the Dokun Nisa was given the entry into United States of America the last very much month. In this case, India shall have no objections to it. So it clearly shows that India has succumbed to the pressure from the China. Now, if you observe, the Augusta Westland scam. So the corruption at the international level, how it is getting complicated. So if you clearly see the statement, even if they start the investigation, if they take 10 years to prove this case, that shows the complexity of the international laws to deal with the money laundering <coughs> and corruption. Coming to the Fed, United States Fed. It did not raise the interest rates, saying that the consumer sentiment has not yet improved in the United States of America. Now, what is the major challenge? Whenever the US increases the interest rates, there can be a flight of capital from India to United States of America. For this matter, as it did not increase the rates, so Indian RBI, it has a greater leg room to change its monetary policy to provide for greater flexibility for the growth rate. Coming to Reliance Defense, last week we read an article where Indian defense companies, private defense companies are not taking up the opportunities which are given to them in the defense sector and most of the cases the public sector undertakings are the major suppliers to the government. Now in this case, to uh, rehaul the AR-32 aircrafts, 100 AN-32 NMO aircrafts, um, the Reliance has come into an agreement with Ukraine firm, which is a positive development. Now, the NEET, the, sub, the government has asked the time to conduct the NEET. Here understand what are the objections to the NEET expressed by the states. Um, the different states have different criteria with regard to entrance examinations. Tamil Nadu takes the 12th standard results um, with the for giving entrance to the medical ex, uh, medical colleges similarly different states also have different reservation policies conduct of one single exam how it will affect uh, the reservation policies of these states is the major question but the supreme court has asked the center to go ahead with the examination where the exam will be held in two phases in the second phase for various students uh, who are taking the courses under the state government curriculum whose syllabus will be finished a bit later. Now, the tax data. Now, clearly observe that um, when Thomas Piketty, he visited New Delhi and he was, when he was addressing the JNU students, uh, he made a statement uh, that is without proper tax data, we cannot understand the creation of wealth uh, and rising inequalities. Uh, in India, less than 4% pay the taxes and the taxable income is very less when compared to the other countries. It means more than 85% of the net national income is outside the tax net. So, if India has to prepare to build its fiscal capacities, it has to make the tax data available for research. In line with this, the government has agreed to release the tax data. So, this is what is the article is. Coming to the Indian Express today, the most important article is about reboot of M.G. Narega. Now, <clears throat> M.G. Narega is 10 years old. This year means we can expect a question and even prelims we can expect a question. So with regard to M.G. Narega, understand this. It is a demand driven program. So wherever the demand is in whatever the state, the center will allocate the money. 
the money is not allocated on the basis of poverty etc in the state now if you observe the amount of the money or amount of the mg narega expenditure made for person in kerala it is around 9000 rupees in tamil nadu it is around 7000 rupees but when you come to up and bihar they are less than 500 rupees it means that um, the program is not effectively used by the poorer states because the program depends on implementation depends upon the governance capacity of the state the poor states generally had the less governance capacity that is the reason why the implementation is also poor so in this context the mg narega need to be changed in such a way that the poverty have to be linked in the state to the mg narega allocations so higher the poverty is more shall be the allocations from mg narega so this line of thought have to be uh, taken for consideration that is what has been said over here coming to the bhagat singh and calling him as a revolutionary terrorist by bipin chandra in his india's independence movement book we all read this for upsc exam now mr bipin chandra has clarified that uh, he wanted to differentiate uh, that era from the parallel ongoing mainstream movement uh, that is gandhian non violence thought so the revolutionary terrorism as a term is used uh, to differentiate it from the other streams um, so it is not to derogate a person that was clarified and mostly this kind of thing shall be for discussion in the academic circles uh, they are not meant for uh, uh, raising the sentiments or else emotions among the people so these are the things we need to consider so thank you very much today i will update the notes a bit because i have to prepare the question paper and it could getting delayed for tomorrow's test so i will update this by i mean notes by afternoon thank you very much